Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about lightweight threads on the JVM, and in particular, their implementation in an open source project called Quasar. Uh, everything I'm going to talk about works on an unmodified JVM, uh, Java 7 and up. Uh, I will be repeating some of the things uh, Jeremy talked about yesterday. Uh, I'll try to get uh, into more depth in some of them. First, a few things about me. Uh, my name is Ron Pressler. I'm the founder of a company called Parallel Universe. Uh, we make an open source server-side software stack. Uh, it extends from uh, storage at the bottom all the way up to the web layer, uh, and it helps application developers uh, write apps that are, uh, work in harmony with modern hardware architectures. Uh, I'm also the author of a blog post series called uh, An Opinionated Guide to Modern Java. It's a bit of marketing for Java. Uh, it got, uh, I think, well over 100,000 uh, uniques. And I also wrote a small uh, open source project called Capsule, uh, which is basically like uh, uh, executable jars on steroids. So if you're looking for a very lightweight uh, deployment solution, you should check it out. OK, so one of the most important things to understand about concurrency is that uh, the concurrency required from an application, or the concurrency of an application uh, is not a feature of the algorithm, but it's a feature of the domain. Uh, if our server has, uh, say, 10,000 uh, concurrent open sessions, then uh, the concurrency required uh, from the application is 10,000. It could be more. Uh, so for example, at a company like Netflix, every incoming uh, request from the client gets turned to uh, 20 to 200 uh, concurrent internal requests into microservices, so the number could actually go much higher. So while a modern Linux box can support up to, say, about 2 million uh, open uh, TCP uh, connections, uh, it can effectively support a much lower number of threads, uh, the order of between 5,000 to 20,000 active threads. And when I say active, I mean threads that, that uh, uh, block and run uh, relatively often. And uh, so the problem is that the, the uh, unit of concurrency given to us by the software, the software unit of concurrency, which is a thread, cannot match the uh, level of concurrency required from uh, many applications today. And there is a mismatch there. And this is, in fact, one of the main problems people have uh, uh, with concurrency. Uh, if we could spawn many more threads to uh, more directly map the concurrency of the application to that of our software, concurrency would become easier. So uh, in addition to, to the high overhead in, in RAM, and Jeremy talked about that of threads, uh, their, scheduling, uh, their scheduling overhead uh, could be quite significant. So let me show you uh, a short demo. OK, so I'm going to start running it while I continue talking. Uh, this is uh, a ring benchmark. It takes some threads, arranges them in a ring, uh, with each thread uh, passing messages to the next one in the ring uh, through a blocking queue. Uh, in this benchmark, we're running uh, 100 threads in two rings, so 200 threads total. Uh, and each ring uh, is going to pass 10,000 uh, messages. So all in all, we have 10,000 messages times 100 threads times two rings. So that's uh, 2 million message passing or scheduling uh, events. So we see uh, a few interesting things. First of all, uh, even though we run it a few times, uh, we don't see the performance uh, going up, uh, the performance improving. In fact, sometimes it's getting worse. I'm not entirely sure uh, why that is. Uh, but you see it's taken somewhere between sometimes 12 seconds, sometimes uh, 9 seconds, let's call it uh, an even 10 seconds. Um, so 10 seconds for 2 million software events not uh, requiring any I.O. Uh, is kind of low. Uh, that means that uh, the operating system can do about 200,000 uh, task switches per second. Uh, this is on a Mac, on a Linux. Uh, it's a little bit better, but not much more. And 200,000 operations that don't require any I.O. per second is not that good for machines that can do 2 billion operations uh, uh, on a single core. So 
so this is one of the reasons people avoid blocking. So how do they avoid blocking? Uh, they use asynchronous APIs. Uh, the simplest way is just to uh, use callbacks. Uh, this, sort of uh, this sort of programming style is known as callback hell because it's so nice to work with. Uh, one of the improvements uh, people try to do um, is to use uh, monads or monadic composition. Uh, there's a very nice project by Netflix called RxJava that does that. But this even got into uh, uh, the JDK in, in Java 8 with completable future, completable stage, uh, where you pass it an asynchronous operation uh, and you tell it, and then once it's done, do this and then do that. But even with this uh, monadic API, um, things aren't clear, quite clear to the programmers. First of all, it's very hard to pass context from one of these operations to another. Um, for example, you can't make use of uh, thread local context. Uh, you're not sure whether the, the operations are allowed to modify any shared data structures. Uh, most often, they can't. Um, and in general, these monads are taking from languages that are based on, on lambda calculus. And, and in lambda cal calculus, you don't really do anything. You just, you just are. And, Monads are a way for uh, these languages to express uh, operations and, and state and transitions as pure computations. But imperative languages, like Java and most other JVM languages, uh, do have a notion of, uh, of uh, doing stuff. And uh, our, our um, uh, model for uh, d executing operations one after another, the, the abstraction is the thread and the way we uh, write that is we write a statement, and if we want another statement to execute after that, we just write it in a line below. So this requires a new, uh, a new kind of API of doing something that we're all used to doing, that, which is part of the language. Uh, also, adopting this, uh, say, a completable future requires uh, API changes. So uh, even uh, Java libraries that today return future need to be uh, changed in order to return a completable future. Another thing about uh, blocking threads uh, is that uh, when, you program, when your program blocks and when you, uh, you're using a, a blocking API, it uses this uh, pull mechanism, like uh, message m equals receive, versus the asynchronous style is push-based. Uh, it just calls on message. So the two uh, are duals of one another. There is a, a constant time transformation from one to the other. Uh, but I like to say, I mean, I, I, I'd want to claim that pull is always, always better than push. Uh, first of all, the transformation from pull to push, if you do need push, is a lot simpler. You just put a while loop around the receive. Uh, if you're going the other way around, you need to add uh, a queue. So it's more complicated, and you have to add a queue. The second uh, advantage is the operating system talks to the software uh, already uh, via pull mechanism. Even all the asynchronous stuff, the OS already has a queue. Like uh, for IO, it's a KQ. Uh, it already has a queue there. And if you're using uh, a push mechanism and you want to uh, change it to, uh, uh, to pull, you have to add another queue. Also, uh, the pull style conveys more information both to the programmer and to the underlying library. Uh, to the programmer, the threading is obvious. You know which thread that message M is going to be processed on. Uh, the other one, it's not so clear. So we don't know whether uh, on message is allowed to be called uh, concurrently on two separate threads. You have to read the docs for that. And you don't know uh, if, um, uh, if on message could be called on two separate threads at two, uh, uh, two different times. Uh, also, it conveys more information to, uh, to the software itself. Uh, in the pull mechanism, there are actually two signals going here. First, when we call the receive method, we're telling the library that we are ready to, uh, to take more data. And when the receive returns, we get the signal containing the data itself. Uh, this buys us uh, implicit uh, back pressure. Uh, on the push side, uh, back pressure is, is, has to be explicit. In fact, there's a, an interesting project now uh, trying to define a Java standard for uh, push-based streams with back pressure. It's called uh, reactive streams. Uh, and there, you have to uh, handle uh, back pressure explicitly. So why replace a good, familiar, natural abstraction 
simply because the uh, implementation provided to us by the operating system is insufficient. We saw there's too much overhead and, and both in terms of RAM and performance. So first we need to understand why that is. Why is it that the, uh, it's hard for the operating system uh, to schedule threads? Uh, one of the reasons is that the operating system has to be very general. It doesn't know anything about the nature uh, of the operations we're running on threads. So uh, imagine there are two threads here, A and B, and uh, they both uh, need to access a shared variable X. Um, message passing is analogous, but let's talk uh, in shared variables. So thread A is gonna lock uh, the lock uh, guarding X, and then uh, it's gonna write the value and unlock it. Uh, and thread B uh, wants to read the value of X, it locks, it blocks until A releases it, and then it reads it. Now, once A unlocks the lock, uh, it tells the operating system to wake up thread B. But the operating system doesn't know anything about what A is gonna wanna be doing next. As far as it know, A is gonna continue running on the same core for another hour. So what the operating system is gonna do, almost invariably, is schedule B on a separate core. Uh, and, but the very first thing B is gonna do is read the value of X. And the value of X is written to the cache on the core running A. So you have a cache miss there already. But um, most transaction serving threads running on servers doing a lot of IO, uh, and not only that kind, uh, work a little bit differently. What they usually do is, what, is when A runs and writes the value of X, uh, we know that it would most likely block very soon right after writing the value of x or sending a message um, to a thread B. So before we go on, uh, let me go over uh, a few definitions. So uh, when we say thread, we mean uh, plain Java thread. Uh, in all JVMs that I know of, it's mapped one-to-one uh, -one onto kernel threads. Uh, a fiber is a user mode lightweight threads uh, scheduled on, uh, onto uh, uh, OS threads but you'd have a small number of OS threads running a very large number of fibers. And a strand is an abstraction introduced by Quasar that covers a unit of concurrency. So a strand is either a, a thread or a fiber. So how do we implement fibers? One way is what Jeremy uh, talked about yesterday. Uh, it has to do with uh, user scheduled kernel threads. Uh, we, uh, now we're talking about a different approach that uses continuations. Uh, you, you, um, uh, express the computation as a continuation and you schedule it onto uh, the CPU. So the, the way Quasar does it is uh, it creates continuations uh, with bytecode injection. So the stack, we need a separate stack, a, st a, user, a user mode stack. Uh, currently the stack is very simple. Uh, it just has a few global arrays. Um, and uh, it uses uh, one array to, uh, to store uh, primitives on the stack, another one to store references, and has another array, we'll see in a second how that's being used, uh, it stores uh, the stack pointer and the program counter. So assume we have uh, these two methods, and uh, method foo calls fiber.park. That's like the terminal uh, blocking operation for fibers. So we say that, few, uh, that, that foo is blocking, uh, and uh, the terminology we use, we call it suspendable. Anything that can block a fiber is called suspendable. Now, bar calls two other methods. It's called baz, it calls baz, which doesn't block, and it calls foo. And this blocking property is transitive. So if foo is suspendable, then bar is also suspendable. So the way we instrument those is as follows. Um, Imagine that the, the, the blocking itself is done uh, by throwing a special, a special exception that is caught at the fiber level, like uh, there's a top level method there that catches the exception. And once we wanna uh, get back into the continuation, so let's take a look at bar first. First of all, we're checking uh, whether or not we're running in, uh, in a fiber. Uh, this is a thread local value. It doesn't always use actual Java thread locals. It, it has a trick there for better performance. But uh, conceptually, that's what it does. Uh, it gets the stack if we're running in a fiber. And then it gets the program counter. Now, the program counter has to be kept separately for each of the methods because we can't jump straight uh, into uh, a deep uh, stack. And then we have a switch statement. So uh, if we blocked uh, when we were running foo, 
uh, then the program counter is going to say one. So we're going to jump to one. Uh, we're going to load the locals onto the real Java stack from uh, our stack objects and going to uh, call foo. Foo is going to do the same thing again. Uh, and it's going to get its own program counter. Its own program counter is now three. And it's going to jump immediately following the park operation and uh, continue execution. Uh, the only difference between those two is you'll notice that in foo, because park is like the terminal uh, blocking uh, operation, uh, it jumps immediately following. It jumps to a point following the call to park, while in bar, it jumps immediately before the call to foo because we need to get back into the depth of the stack. So you will think that this whole thing uh, introduces a lot, of, a lot of burden, and this is what we thought at first, uh, but then we were uh, very pleasantly surprised to see that that is not the case. It actually works very, very well. So here, as a, a short JMH benchmark, uh, it is basically a function with, or a method uh, with, uh, I don't remember how many local, I think something like four or five local variables, uh, and it calls itself recursively up to a depth of, of 20 recursive, recursive calls. So the baseline is not using fibers at all, no instrumentation. Uh, it takes about 72 nanos. If you have to, if, uh, if you are running the fiber and you have to block and reschedule the fiber, that whole thing takes 418 nanoseconds. Uh, and if you're just running in the fiber but you're not parking, uh, it takes about half of that, uh, around 200 milliseconds, uh, 200 nanoseconds, sorry. So this entire scheduling overhead introduced by fibers is on the order of 500 nanoseconds. Uh, Contrast that with how long it takes to switch a thread, which is, as we've seen, about 20 uh, microseconds. So we're over an order of magnitude better. Um, so in terms of latency, the overhead is negligible because remember, all these methods that need to be instrumented are blocking methods. So if we add another 500 nanoseconds to a blocking method, it's no big deal. Uh, but our whole point is that we would want to use uh, those uh, clock cycles for running other fibers. So it does, it could, it could uh, uh, amount to something. Uh, we would rather uh, it would be lower. Um, so you, again, you can, you can look at the numbers. It starts at depth three, it goes up to 20. Right, but you'll see, we'll, we'll see in a second how, how we actually run Java libraries and uh, Usually on fibers, it doesn't get very deep, and we'll explain. So um, some issues about uh, doing con uh, continuations this way. So first, as we've seen before, uh, when we were calling, um, when Bart was calling uh, foo. So foo is a suspendable call site that we had to instrument around. So we had to instrument around it. We didn't need to do anything uh, for Baz. So we need to find those uh, suspendable call sites. Uh, it gets a little bit more tricky uh, when you get to inheritance and interfaces. So if a superclass method or an interface have a single implementation that is suspendable, then calling that interface method is a suspendable call site. Uh, also, we assume that all reflective calls or uh, uh, invoke dynamic, uh, method handles, all that uh, is also presumed to be suspendable unless we see that it's just a lambda creation. That's a special case. So we need to figure out which methods to instrument. And we have two options. We could either tell the user to tell us. Uh, in Quasar, this can be done with a, sus with a suspendable annotation. Uh, or if you're writing the code in Java, uh, you can make use of, of checked exceptions. And the checked exceptions uh, in Java, they're also transitive. So it makes sure that if a function calls another function that throws a checked exception, you have to uh, annotate your own uh, without exception. Or uh, you can do an automatic uh, uh, call graph analysis. You can load all the classes of the application either ahead of time, usually it's done ahead of time, uh, and see which methods are calling which and uh, to find all methods that are potentially uh, uh, suspendable and instrument them. Uh, so here we, hit in, uh, we, we get into some trouble because um, it works fine for Java, but for other JVM languages, um, a single method or a single function in, say, Scala or Clojure 
could compile, and they often compile, to more than one uh, JVM method. So if we are doing the annotation manually, we need to know uh, which JVM methods uh, the, the, say, closure uh, function compiles to. So we, we had to do that specifically for closure, so we, other than Java, we support closure. Uh, and if you're doing the, the instrumentation uh, automatically doing, uh, using call graph analysis, then you can have this, this infection. Because imagine that uh, somebody makes uh, an implementation of runnable, uh, the runnable interface that is suspendable, then all calls anywhere to runnable uh, might have to be uh, 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 instrumented, and you'd end up instrumenting uh, pretty much everything. So this is a problem we have uh, doing continuations this way. And if, if the, the JVM could give us uh, native continuations, uh, those based on, on uh, throwables uh, would, be, would work perfectly, uh, then all of our problems would go away. And this seems to be like kind of a theme on this conference. I think this would also help the Nazarene guys with their uh, de-optimization uh, and uh, JRuby guys with uh, their own types of fibers. Okay, so once we have continuation, there's a question of scheduling. So in Quasar, you can schedule uh, fibers uh, onto any executor, uh, even on the EDT, the, events dispatch, the UI event, event dispatch thread, and works very nicely. You can actually block on the event dis uh, dispatch thread. Uh, but they work best uh, on fork join pool, pool in uh, async mode. Uh, and work stealing is great for, uh, for uh, fibers. Uh, we'll see why uh, in the next slide. And the two most important operations on fibers are park and rpark, just like they are on threads. Uh, and they're implemented with leases, just as they are uh, for threads. So if you unpark before you park, then you won't park that time. Um, so we mentioned before that, that threads running transactions uh, usually block shortly after they wake up another uh, strand, let's call it. Uh, and uh, this works very well uh, on a, a work stealing scheduler because when we run uh, fiber A and it writes a value of X and it wakes up B, then we know that A is going to park very, very soon. So instead of scheduling B onto another uh, CPU core, we just wait that that uh, fork join task stays in the thread local queue, and in a few nanoseconds or microseconds, when A doesn't uh, indeed block, uh, fiber B is gonna get scheduled uh, onto the same OS thread, uh, and hopefully onto the same core, and the value of X is already gonna be in the cache. So that works uh, very well. Another nice uh, thing we do is, I'm not gonna get uh, too much into this, but uh, we occasionally, every 100 milliseconds or so, go over all the uh, fork join pool, pool uh, threads, and we look at the fibers that are currently running. And every time a fiber blocks and unblocks, it increments a counter. And if we encounter the same fiber twice with the same run number, we know that it hasn't blocked for 100 milliseconds. Uh, and if that's the case, it means that our assumptions about fiber behavior are wrong. Uh, either the fiber is accidentally blocking the actual thread by calling a real thread blocking IO operation, or it's just uh, running a, a computation that's too long, so we'll issue a warning. So uh, let's see how that works. So we're gonna run the exact same, uh, the exact same benchmark, only this time with fibers. Okay, so this time uh, we actually see the performance uh, improving, and instead of taking about 10 seconds, it's taking one second, and we just got an order of magnitude better task switching. Okay, so uh, what are the things that you can do with fibers? So um, one of the things is you can uh, use a programming style called uh, uh, CSP, uh, uh, what is it called? Communicating sequential process. Communicating sequential process. This is a model used by uh, the Go language. Uh, here you're spawning these two fibers. There's a channel between them. 
Uh, you can send a message on the channel. Those channels are selectable. You can wait on uh, a few uh, channels at a time. Uh, in fact, I've basically transliterated uh, Go programs uh, to Java using uh, Quasar. They work great. They often work better than they do in Go. Uh, because of the instrumentation overhead, uh, the scheduling is a little bit slower. Again, uh, JVM continuations would help with that. But once you start doing any work, then uh, the JVM's advantage uh, come into play, and it actually performs better than Go. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, data flow programming, or, or reactive programming, some call it. Uh, it's a programming style that's similar to, uh, uh, to a spreadsheet. So we have uh, vals, which are data flow constants, and vars are data flow variables. Uh, and we can have dependencies. So uh, var y uh, will always have the value of a times x. Same thing for, for uh, z. Uh, and whenever the, value, the, whenever the value of a is set, then var could go on uh, uh, trying to compute its value. And whenever the value of x changes, then y is going to get recomputed. And uh, we can listen to those changes. Uh, and this way, we pass information around the program uh, without uh, without caring when the data is going to flow in. Uh, another thing we can do with fibers is we can have actors running on them, just like, just like Erlang. Uh, as, and because we allow blocking on fibers, uh, we can block in actors just like uh, Erlang does. Uh, a cool thing we've added recently, it's still experimental, is fiber serialization. Because we keep the stack uh, in a, uh, on a heap object, uh, we can serialize it and then resume a blocked fiber on a separate machine. And uh, there are cases where, where it comes in handy. So what are the issues when using fiber? So the, the main one is integrating with third-party libraries and even with the JDK libraries themselves. So uh, the libraries have to be fiberware. We'll see, we'll see uh, how we solve that. Uh, and we must take care to instrument all the potentially blocking methods. Said we could do it automatically or manually. But that's something we have to think about. And this point is, is the most annoying point. And of course, that would get resolved with, with JVM continuations. Uh, another problem is debuggers. Uh, a debugger is not aware of the fiber. So when a fiber block, a debugger just sees uh, an exception thrown. Um, so this is a problem. Uh, but again, uh, this shouldn't be too hard to uh, fix a few debuggers to, to take fibers into account. But in spite of all these issues, uh, issues uh, fibers and threads work very well alongside one another. We'll see that. Uh, and they don't require API changes. So a blocking API stays the same, only we try to make it fiberware. Uh, when it comes to all the concurrency primitives, the Java util concurrent, uh, we've got you covered. We have uh, implementations that are fiberware with the same API. And uh, if you're doing I.O., then you have to integrate those I.O. libraries with the fibers, but usually uh, an application shouldn't use more than, say, five I.O. libraries. Uh, and uh, uh, so it's not that big a deal uh, integrating them with fibers. So how do we make fibers and threads work alongside one another? We have uh, the abstraction called strand. So strand is a unit of concurrency, which is either a thread or uh, a fiber. And we have these methods and many more on the strand class. Uh, we can get the current strand. Uh, we can park it, unpark it, join uh, a running strand, uh, and get, uh, get the stack trace. So let's take a look at a simplified uh, implementation of a mutex. Uh, all of the stuff in Java Util Concurrent look uh, a bit like that. So a mutex is basically uh, an atomic Boolean saying whether or not uh, the mutex is locked. And it has a queue of waiting waiter threads. In order to make this code work with fibers, all we have to do is everywhere it says thread, we change it to strand. And everywhere it says lock support.park, we change it to strand.park. And we've literally done this for some of the uh, uh, Java util concurrent uh, code. And it works just, you do this search replace, and it just works. And once the strand uh, uh, abstraction is there, this mutex would work equally well for fibers and for threads. And in fact, it would work for them at the same time. So you can have a fiber and a thread both, wa both waiting on this mutex. Now, about IO libraries. So most modern IO libraries, 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, JDBC is not one of them. Uh, they uh, provide an asynchronous API. So we said that we don't like asynchronous API, but we would want to use them under the covers. So assuming we have this class uh, foo that takes a callback, and the callback, uh, the operation, the asynchronous operation could either terminate successfully or fail. Um, we use a class called fiber async. Fiber async implements uh, this callback interface, and uh, whenever it terminates, uh, it either it says async completed or async failed and communicates it back to the fiber async class. And now we can implement uh, a blocking version of the, of the uh, asynchronous API of async op. We can now implement op. And using this foo async that we've just created, uh, and we just need to override uh, a method called request async. And, uh, in that method, which is called immediately after the, the fiber has been parked, uh, we register the fiber async pro, uh, object as the callback, and we call run, and this is going to block until, uh, until the callback completes. So once the callback completes, the fiber is going to uh, unpark and continue running. And now we're coming back to the stack. A lot, so if you're using a library, that uh, does, uh, has an async API, a lot of the stack is going to be uh, registering, what, when you call uh, foo.asyncop, registering the callback and waking this up when, when this callback uh, is, is called. And all of this doesn't need to be stored on the fiber stack. All of this it, uh, goes on on plain uh, uh, thread stacks, and we don't even need to store those values. That's why uh, fiber uh, stacks are usually uh, very small. So one of the things we can do with that is re-implement the Java NIO uh, uh, API using fibers that, under the covers, use the async NIO, uh, NIO API. And here we have a, a small server. Uh, the only changes we need to make in our code is instead of uh, uh, creating a server socket channel, we create a fiber service socket channel. We start a fiber that simply loops, accepting uh, new connections. Uh, and once we accept the connection, we spawn a new fiber to manage that connection. Uh, it reads in, the, it reads in the, 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 the data and sends a response. It reads in a request and sends a response. This performs... Uh, about 5% worse than pure uh, NIO async. The reason for that is that NIO async has uh, synchronization built in because it doesn't know um, which uh, threads are going to call what. But here we know that everything uh, remains within the fiber, so we can actually make this better by removing those uh, synchronizations. And uh, this code is a lot simpler. It's blocking. It's very, very high performance. So it's a simple blocking server that performs and scales really well. So uh, fibers buy us the same performance benefits uh, of async uh, while keeping the familiar and easy and, I would say, uh, code that uses the correct abstraction. But fibers aren't enough. Uh, I think that the future of concurrency uh, uh, lies in uh, two things. Uh, the first is lightweight threads. Like I said, it makes concurrency a lot easier because we can spawn so many of them. You can spawn a million fibers uh, on, a, on a single JVM instance. But you also have to manage uh, mutable shared data. Uh, even Haskell programs do that. They use an external uh, database, but that has to be done. So um, STM, general purpose STM is kind of dead, but we can, uh, there are, we can implement uh, domain-specific uh, STM quite successfully and I'm going to end by showing you the following demo that combines those uh, two ideas. So when we first load, there are a lot of class loading going on. So you see that warning that says that uh, fibers are hogging the CPU. And that's normal. That's what I was talking about, that we check whether fibers uh, block often enough. And it happens just, uh, uh, just when we fire up the application. OK, so here we have, 
I see the resolution here is not that great. Uh, here we have uh, a few spaceships. Each of them is an actor running on its own uh, uh, lightweight thread and its own fiber. Now, the code for each of them is very, very simple. It's just sort of an infinite loop, uh, processing messages sent by other spaceships, which are actor messages. And uh, in order, the, the shared state here is a database. Uh, it's an in-memory database, so it's kind of like uh, domain-specific uh, software transactional memory. And each of these spaceships updates its location every, in every frame, updates its location in the database and queries its surrounding. So it won't collide into other spaceships and it would uh, find other spaceships to, to fire at. Uh, now we're currently running at 26 frames per second. Each of these spaceships uh, does three database transactions per frame and uh, all the code is blocking. All the accesses to the database are simple. This is all very simple blocking code. There's no global optimization here. Every spaceship runs its own uh, thread, its own lightweight thread. And if we zoom out, I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to see that. But each of those pixels is an actual spaceship, uh, and we could get a good. I think I'm running three or four thousand here uh, for a total of about three hundred thousand uh, blocking database transactions per second, um, currently with three or four thousand lightweight threads. All right, questions. What is absolutely must? Continuations. Continuations, yes. Right, so so uh, uh, Jeremy was talking about uh, integrating with, you know, they have to integrate the entire ecosystem. So, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, synchronized blocks. So synchronized blocks, obviously, unlike the Java util concurrent classes, are not fiberware. Uh, but like I said, uh, so that's true. Uh, but the, even the, the uh, Java util concurrent classes, you don't need two versions of them. If you work with strands, it would work equally well for fibers and, uh, and uh, threads, regardless of how, how, fibers are, are instrument, uh, are, how fibers are implemented, whether they're using like uh, bytecode injection or some internal uh, JVM mechanism. We would love to have that in, uh, internal JVM mechanism. The uh, instrumentation is the most annoying part of this. Uh, but the thing is that it, even now, it's working very well. And uh, I forgot to mention this, but uh, we've even uh, integrated uh, servlet containers with this. So under the covers, we use the asynchronous servlet API, which unfortunately almost no, no one uses, because most people writing servlets are not aware of these things. Uh, and we expose the plain blocking simple serverless API, and instead of uh, giving each a incoming HTTP request uh, uh, a kernel thread, we just give it a fiber. And we've even, even managed to run Jersey, the full Jersey stack in the fiber, so you can run uh, uh, your uh, um, REST service uh, using plain Jersey. Uh, again, so it's not seamless. You have to tell it that you're using fibers, and uh, JVM continuations uh, would uh, go a long way towards uh, making that a lot simpler. Uh, but even before, and I agree with you that one day we'll that's, that's where the world is going and the JVM would have to support this kind of uh, uh, 
uh, concurrency at all levels, but even long before that, we can do very useful things. No, so again, it's not, it's not block, it's uh, our own blocking queue. Um, and the disruptor is a bit heavyweight for that because we need, remember, we can have millions of those queues. But internally, uh, those queues are very similar to how the disruptor is implemented. Oh, that doesn't matter because um, the, the cost there is not the blocking queue itself, but the blocking. What, you're, what that benchmark is measuring uh, is how long it takes for the operating system to do a task switch. So if you have to block in anything, then the operating system has to deschedule and then reschedule uh, a thread, and it doesn't matter which mechanism you use to pass the messages. So it's just a way of testing the operating system's uh, uh, task switching overhead. Not, it doesn't really test the implementation of the, of the array blocking queue. The, 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 the scheduling overhead is much higher than the overhead of the queue itself. It's not the whole code base. It just, it's, just blocking, it's just blocking methods. Every blocking method would have that constant between 200 and 400 nanosecond overhead. And like I said, that is unfortunate, and uh, having continuation supplied by the JVM would, would help with that, because you wouldn't need the instrumentation. And what the problem is, is not just the, the overhead of, of storing the stack values onto the stack object. It's also that you can't jump directly deep into the stack. You have to do this branching at every, when, when, you, when you unblock the fiber, you have to do this branching at every, uh, uh, at, every stack, uh, at every stack level. So you branch again and again and again, and all that to get into the, the, the bottom of the stack, um, or the top of the stack, and, um, uh, and that, that adds overhead. But that overhead, like I said, is about 500 nan nanoseconds. Right, so here you do pay some. The benchmark showed that uh, instead of paying about 450 nanoseconds, you pay half of that because you don't do all this branching again. So uh, it's about half of that. If you don't block, you pay 200, 250 nanoseconds. But again, it's in functions that could potentially block. Right, so every fiber you can tell it which scheduler to use. Uh, you, you can either use, right, so you can, you can either use uh, uh, the default fork join pool, you can use several fork join pools, or any executor you want. You could, you could even multiplex uh, many, uh, many fibers onto a single thread, which is what we do when we, when we want to run on. Right, so you could do, you, you, well, either you have a more uh, uh, intricate uh, scheduler, or you can just say different sizes of thread pools, or even uh, thread priority, if your OS supports thread priorities. And
Right. So this, whenever, so because this runs in an unmodified JVM, an unmodified kernel, then at the end of the day, you have to, you have to uh, basically assign those fibers to OS threads because you can't actually get, you can't control uh, the CPU di directly. You have to go through the OS. No, so we've not run into issues simply because we're not instrumenting the most, uh, the most optimization heavy methods at all. We're only instrumenting the blocking methods. So like I said, in terms of, so that cost is 500 nanoseconds added onto uh, a task switch. And a task switch, and, and remember the alternative. The alternative is an OS level task switch which takes an order of magnitude more. So even if the uh, VM can't optimize that instrumentation. It doesn't matter because we just need, need it to be better than what the OS can do, than the alternative, which is blocking the OS level, and we get to an order of magnitude better. And, and even more than that, if we have uh, JVM supplied continuation. Yes. Uh, no, in that case, you'd have to do, uh, he, he asks, uh, what if you do block uh, in run runnables? So uh, you just won't use the automatic instrumentation. Uh, you'll have to tell it which, uh, what, which part of your code runs runnables inside fibers, and you'd only have to instrument those. Code that's not running in fibers, you wouldn't have to, uh, you wouldn't have to instrument. But if you do block in runnables, you really shouldn't use the uh, automatic instrumentation and do it manually. Tell it which uh, functions to, which methods to, to uh, instrument. What uh, you, you say, VM support for for uh, for continuations. So the best way, uh, the way uh, these continuations here are are handled is that when you block, you throw an exception, and you want to know the state of the stack at the moment of the exception being thrown. So the way we do it now, we have to maintain the or, or copy over the stack before call, calling the exception. But if that exception could encapsulate the state of the stack. We could just jump right into the exception and to the point where it's been thrown and continue from there with the stack restored. Okay. Yeah, so I agree there's more research to be done, but like I said, even a simple global array uh, works well for now. Uh, and and uh, uh, the point is that you can add this utility, the, the basic, ut or a lot of, or you, you can make this very useful even ve with a very simple representation. Uh, of course, it's interesting to go into this into, uh, in more de detail and really understand how the stacks look, how they grow, et cetera, and, and whether you want a, contig a contiguous growing stack or maybe, uh, you know, like a linked structure of arrays, uh, that's interesting. But even as it, as it stands now, it's very useful.
All right, so that's open for discussion. And, but please, even any kind of, and, and I think, uh, I, I don't see the, uh, the Nazorn guys, I think what they need for the de-optimization is a similar, actually a similar kind of continuation based on, based on throwables. Thank you.